Did this man get so mad that his monocle fell into his cup of tea? <laughs> so that's why I'm actually glad we didn't spend the time to talk about it a but few we weeks ago. We didn't spend the time to talk about it. You're <laughs> terrible. I need to read the show notes before we start talking about these things. Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. This week, we ride a roller coaster of NIH grant funding news. Hold on tight and stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 74. I'm Joshua Hall. And I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Good evening, Daniel. Good evening, Josh. Good to see you once again. Good to see you. I feel like it's been a while. It probably has. Yeah, we're a little behind on our normal every other week schedule. We apologize. Summertime and podcasting is not easy. That's right. We are on the summertime schedule right now. (laughs) I think we just, yeah, everybody's traveling, coming in and coming and going. So um, try and and keep up with us. We'll try and uh, keep putting out episodes as we get the chance to be in the same room. Yeah. And it's not that we don't have topics to talk about. No, it's not that. We have plenty of things on lots the agenda. Lots of topics. Yeah. Lots of topics. Yeah. I think we need to just get together and knock out like three or four at once. Should we really, We could do like a Netflix series now where we just do an episode dump of like five episodes at one time. Dump being the operative word. <laughs> but then it would be like, all right, season five will come out in yeah. eight months or 2018. something. Yeah. My preference would always be that we released on the day every two weeks and let's try it but we're, we're struggling with that but we're doing our best and we're here for you listeners and we thank you for hanging with us and continuing to tune in it's been really fun to see the numbers grow and and to hear from more and more of you it's been really cool so thank you yeah lots of great stuff in the docket but coming up right now i think you have an ethanol for us i do so this was brought to me by a friend who is from Virginia. Uh, He was down here visiting, and he knows we have a podcast where we drink some beers. And he actually doesn't know anything about the podcast as far as the actual grad school PhD stuff, but he just knows we drink beer on the show. Soon to be listener. Yeah, so he brought me some beer, and this is one of his favorites. This is uh, from Richmond, Virginia. This is Legend Brewing Brown Ale. Okay, let's give it a taste. And it's just called Brown Ale. So, and it is brown. It has a dark, sort of rich amber color. It's very nice. It reminds me of like an English style beer or yeah, something. Yeah, it tastes like a brown ale to me. It's a, it's a. Well, I'm glad. Good brown ale. Here's the thing about <laughs> brown ales. I can't tell the difference between them. Can you? Yeah, I was going to say that. Um, have you ever had a brown ale that tasted differently than this brown ale? I don't think so, but maybe I just don't have the, the nose for the brown ale flavor profile. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it's a very. No, it's a it's a sweet beer. It's a uh, very smooth. I mean, I don't know. It's a fine beer. Oh, so it's just, very. It doesn't stand out to me. It's very quaffable. Is that a word? Yeah, uh, I teach. Spell I teach, it. Uh, Spell well, I teach. It. It's Q U A F F A B L E. I teach G R E prep, and uh, that is one of our vocabulary words. Sounds like a useful one. To quaff. Wait till the etymology puzzle. We'll find a way to work that in. I quaff. I have quaffed. I am quaffing. <laughs> <laughs> I am quaffing. <laughs> All right. Uh, actually, Dan, speaking of hearing from our listeners, uh, we have a new iTunes review. And by new, I mean this came in at the end of February. And it's entitled Great Listen During Mundane Bench Work. And this is from Crush 3 And he or she said, Love listening to the insight, humor, and wisdom Josh and Dan have to offer. Grad school is hard, and it's comforting to know that you're not alone It's also great for those considering grad school or those who know someone in grad school to better understand what it's like. Mundane bench work. What is that? I had no experience with that. Man, I was thinking about this the other day, Dan. How unfortunate is it that there were not podcasts when we were going through grad school? Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, maybe there were. We were we were just trying to figure out when podcasts existed. I bet I bet there were podcasts. It just not had it just had not gotten to us yet. Yeah, that's right. We still had gramophones. It was really a I bet if we time. were at like Harvard or Stanford, we would have had podcasts. Oh, I think but, so. Yeah, yeah. We had that and quite made their way to the uh, Facebook existed. There must have been podcasts. We had Facebook. Uh, did you listen to music 
during I grad did. school? Usually I listened to NPR on whatever the radio was in the tissue Because okay, so that's room. definitely the precursor to the podcast. Totally. Right? Uh, most of my yeah. podcasts I listen to are from NPR, so yeah, says something about me, I guess. Also, Dan, speaking of listeners, we have a new Patreon patron. Horn noise! Yes, thank you so much to Paul, who was kind and generous enough to support us on Patreon. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. And um, yeah, that's a good reminder. If you would like to support the show, uh, help to offset some of the costs of hosting, uh, we would love that. You can go to patreon.com slash HelloPhD or just go to our HelloPhD site and click the Become a Patron button. If you'd like us to get our episodes out on time, we'll feel much <laughs> more guilty when we've got people donating on Patreon. That's true. Actually, you'll increase, we know you're expecting it. Yeah. Increasing the guilt level. That's what it's all about. Uh, also, Dan, thinking about future issues... Uh, One thing that I think would be really fun is to share some listener stories about some really epic lab fails or maybe your craziest day in lab or something really bizarre that's happened to you in lab. I think it'd be really fun to to hear our listeners' craziest and weirdest stories from the lab. Yeah, and if if you don't have a crazy one, but you know the guy down the hall does, uh, let us know about that too. Yeah, I remember that episode we did a while back with Craig and Nicole and the story about the the radioactivity that got tracked all over town and they and bulldozed the sidewalk. The sidewalk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what we're, It doesn't have to be Spoiler that epic. Spoiler alert, Josh. <laughs> yeah, go back and listen to that one. It doesn't have to be that epic. But yeah, just we'd love to hear your stories. Because um, really, like like Jay Crush 3 said, uh, one point of this podcast is so you know you're not alone. So let's uh, share the conversation. Yeah, we want stories that are somewhere between like hilarious, I broke a glass vessel that contained $150,000 worth of antibody and somebody got a lethal dose of radi- radiation. Let's keep it below the lethal dose of radiation and above the... You know, I love a good, I forgot to screw the rotor on the uh, ultra yeah. centrifuge story. You that know. scares me. Yeah, that's, that's what we want. That's what we want. As long as everyone survived. That's yeah, what no. we want to know. All right, Dan. Um, it's been a while, but are you ready for some science in the news? I am more than ready because it's been such a long time. All right, Dan, so this is a topic that I actually was going to cover a few weeks back, but I'm really glad now that I procrastinated this topic until now, and I'll tell you why. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some key changes that NIH has announced for the way they give out grants. Oh, sorry. Did you say something about changes to the NIH policy? Well, Dan, you wouldn't feel that way if you were someone relying on NIH grants. You would be very interested, as I'm sure some of our listeners are. So as I think most of our listeners probably know, especially those in the biomedical science, NIH is by far the primary funder of biomedical research in our country. You knew that. True. Right? True. I'll say true every time you say something true. So on May the 3rd, NIH announced a grant cap to free up more funds for more investigators. And so there was a new policy announced by our good friend of the show, NIH Director Francis Collins. And basically what this new policy would do is it would limit the amount of support that a single investigator could have calculated by this new index called the Grant Support Index, or GSI. And so what this Grant Support Index would do is basically it would assign a points to different types of grants. So if you get an R01, which is kind of like the big granddaddy grant that a lot of biomedical investigators are looking for, an R01 would get you seven points, okay? And so what this new um, NIH limit would do is a single lab, a single investigator would not be able to get more grants than equal up to 21 points. Okay, let's step back one minute. So the premise here is we're going to put a, a lid on how much total NIH money your lab can take as a private investigator. I am personally a little bit surprised to learn that there are people with more than three R01s. Yeah. So Is that a common occurrence? Well, it's not common, but, um, but let, me, let me give you some, some numbers. So this is how NIH came to uh, this policy. So what they observed and others had observed was that NIH funding had become highly skewed. And so about 10% of NIH grant recipients accounted for more than 40% of all the total funding. It's like the 1% and the 99%. It's happening in science. It's actually true. So they they determined there's, if you want to call it this, some income inequality, I guess you could say. What is happening? (laughs) In NIH funding. So so yeah, like 10% of all the people, one out of 10 people applying for grants are getting, approaching half of all 
the pot, all the pie. I'd like to announce my new protest, the Occupy the Autoclave Room <laughs> movement. No, I don't think anybody wants to occupy the Autoclave Room. How about Occupy the Coffee Nook? Yeah, so it looks like there were about 2,000 investigators that actually fit into this over three R01 category, which is actually a lot, I thought. Uh, so, so one quote from Francis Collins that I thought was pretty good was in his justification of doing this, he said, uh, this is a quote, because scientific discovery is inherently unpredictable, there are reasons to believe supporting more researchers working on a diversity of biomedical problems rather than concentrating resources in a smaller number of labs might maximize the number of discoveries that can emerge from the science we support. Totally with him. In the in the world of business, there are the big giants, the GEs, and the you know companies that are very slow to move, but they're very reliable, very sturdy. And then there are the startups, and the startups rise and fall, but you have to make a lot of bets to get one Facebook or one Uber or whatever it is. So is he saying he's going to take that same kind of approach where it's a, a world of innovation and, yeah, this might not work, but... If one out of 100 does, we've just made a huge advance. Yeah, that's right. So it's kind of thinking you get, you know, the idea is you get diminishing returns by concentrating the money. Um, and then if you think about Dan, you know, a single lab, whereas obviously they're doing a lot of things with all that money, if you have four or five, six R01s, um, the amount of different ideas that are coming out of that lab might be different than if you spread... Uh, maybe you took three of those R01s and you gave them to three different investigators who are approaching the problem in different ways with different people and different ideas. And so we're more likely to actually come up with some really innovative discoveries by funding more, more different, different people. people. Yeah, I think that's a hypothesis. And he's a scientist. Yeah. Let's try it. Yeah. Well, as you might be not surprised to learn, uh, there were mixed reactions to this announcement because this represented a pretty fundamental shift in how NIH awarded awarded money. So there certainly were a lot of younger and mid-career investigators who saw this as a very positive change. Uh, well, actually, it's probably not surprising. If you were a person who did not have three hour ones, <laughs> you probably thought this was, okay, it's not a bad idea. Weird. But if you were a lab that had more than three hour ones, you were a little bit skeptical. And so there was a Boston Globe article that came out just, I don't know, a week or two ago. And it was called Scientists Worry About Plan to Cap Individual Labs Federal Funding. And so as you might know, Dan, the Boston area, uh, there's a lot of NIH funding. So Massachusetts universities actually received $2.5 billion in NIH grants, which is more than 10% of all total awards are concentrated just in Boston alone. Wow. Uh, which so I if you want to do research, go to Boston. There's your tip of the day. Yeah. So, so anyway, this Boston Globe piece interviewed a few of these researchers from Boston area universities. And let me tell you some quotes uh, that they had to say. So this first one is from Doug Melton, who is a stem cell scientist at Harvard. And so what he said is if you had a sports team, you want Tom Brady on the field every time. Uh, Tom Brady, he's a quarterback, Dan, for the New England Patriots. not familiar. Is that some sort of sports Uh, ball reference? Yeah, he's generally considered to be pretty good. You don't want the second string or the third string. So you want Tom Brady on the field. You don't want the second, third string. Um, Did this man get so mad that his monocle fell into his cup of tea? (laughs) I'm uh, just picturing like the Monopoly <laughs> Uncle Pennybags character, like <laughs> yeah. How do you react to that quote? I don't know. That's pretty condescending. I don't. I haven't met this man, and maybe he said it in a very nice way, but it sounds really terrible. And actually, Dan, just as an aside, uh, not only is it not a very collegial thing to say about your fellow scientists, um, but it's actually a really terrible sports analogy because it turns out Sir Tom Brady, who's this very highly regarded quarterback, turns out. Um, I have heard of Tom Brady. Uh, I do. Right I we watched the Super Bowl together. Right. So it turns out Tom Brady was a sixth round draft pick in the NFL and was the 199th person picked overall in 2000. He was a seventh string quarterback when he started in college, and he actually was the fourth string quarterback for the Patriots when he first started. So he was not a superstar. Uh, yeah, tell me again how you want Tom Brady as your person who gets invested in. So yeah. I would argue Tom Brady would represent the uh, the plucky upstart PI at not Harvard, yeah, right? So the, the, who gets their first R01. The true outcome of that analogy <laughs> is why don't we invest in our sixth string and our seventh string and see what can arise out of that and, and make a difference. Well, that's what I think. But here's a lot of the controversy. So this is another quote. This is from Bob Langer, who is a professor at MIT. And 
He said, I'm a big believer in making things merit-based. I think you'd want to fund the highest quality science. Anything that funds poorer science has a negative effect on Massachusetts and on the nation and on the world. Now, the stakes are very high. I mean, this really does, it, it represents a, a blindness, a myopia to how investment is made in the rest of the world. And, and I referenced like a startup gets money and they take a risk and a lot of them fail. Most of them fail. But then some succeed and the world is different. This just strikes me. I can imagine some some industrialist saying, well, give all of your money to GE and to Amazon and to these companies that are, are gigantic because we're the ones that are going to make the difference. Why would you give your money to this startup no one's ever heard of? Yeah, I mean, if I was, uh, if I was an investor back in the turn of the 20th century, I would totally put my money in horse and buggies. You should. That's where the smart money is. That's, that's, that's what we know. That's what we've always done. That's our first string buggy maker. Yeah. Uh, but do you, do you buy this stand? Do you buy this notion that the highest quality science is the best funded science? No. Look, I mean, if you look out into um, uh, how people who get money that maybe didn't expect to get it in this way, they're going to work 10 times harder. You know, if you if you are what he would call a six string uh, lab and you get a grant, you know, you've got a lot riding on that more than uh, a PI getting his fifth or sixth R01. Like, eh, I don't have to work as hard for that fifth or sixth R01. But but if this is my only chance at money and my lab will succeed or fail, like I'm going to be there longer hours. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to make sure that I'm doing the right things. If we want to come up with the answer to a really hard problem, do we put a lot of money in three different ideas or a little less money in eight different ideas. Yeah, I've long wanted to see money spread around a little bit in research because I think we're getting to that place where the same people are doing the same research and it's just, it's it's very derivative and it's very incremental and we're not seeing outside the box thinking because, you know, this is how you, they became successful at the industry of getting grant money and, and I think they're doing good research, but don't, don't take that away from them. But there's still opportunity for somebody else to have a chance. Yeah, you know, you're right, Dan. I've heard, you know, I've heard faculty complain about this. That yeah, in, anymore the funding agencies don't reward innovative science and innovative ideas. Um, they reward the next incremental step, um, which maybe is not necessarily on the path to some, you know, really amazing discovery. It'll be interesting to see how the the job market shakes out for research. So if I've got five R01s, do I have economies of scale where I only hire two lab techs? Whereas if there were five individual labs with R01s, that would be five lab techs. I mean, I think there's there might be some interesting shifts in employment if there are more labs getting funding. Yeah, no, I, I agree. But anyway, Dan, so we've had a really great conversation about this um, the pros and cons of this new NIH initiative to limit funding on individual labs. But what I want to let you know is on June the 8th, just a few days ago, NIH abandoned their plan to <laughs> cap grants no, to big labs. don't do this to me. <laughs> and so this, is, uh, this just you happened this week. You got me all worked up and then they took it away? Yeah, so that's why I'm actually glad we didn't spend the time to talk about it a but few we weeks just ago. Did spend the time to talk about it. You're terrible. I need uh, to read the show notes before we start talking about these things. Well, you know, Dan, the reaction you just had um, is a little bit the reaction that I had when I read this. First of all, I was a little had a little bit of disbelief that you know just over a month ago they announced this. Yeah, but I don't understand. Then, so, so where is the the rich scientist lobby that was able to turn this over? Like, well, what changed the mind? You know, I mean. That's one thing that's not clear to me is whether NIH's pretty quick reversal on this grant index, whether it represented this sincere desire to listen and get feedback from its benefactors, or if it was just being overly sensitive to the voice of certain bigwigs who I, have influential I mean, voices. Yeah, but I don't on. know. How big are their wigs? It's not like they're don't making campaign donations to Francis Collins. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's interesting because Again, maybe this, maybe I'm in a different bubble, but most of the voices that I heard, even though if they wanted to understand more, you know, had this sort of a generally overall positive view of this new index, although most of the people I talk to and hang around are mostly early mid career scientists. Um, and I do agree with Francis Collins that funding more ideas is better than funding a few ideas. Uh, but it just seemed, seemed like this sets a very tenuous precedent 
if you're if I'm in the shoes of NIH, right? Yeah, now every policy I come out with, if everybody just squawks loud enough, then I'll change it. Yeah, and you know, on one hand, one thing I've liked about working with NIH is there have been times that they have certainly reached out to the people who are benefiting from their grant funding to get feedback and see what things are working, what things aren't working, what changes could we make. But I've never seen anything, because really, I mean, when NIH announced this, they came out, they came out hard, like all of the uh, institute directors, they were talking about it and they were selling it and they're being interviewed about it. And then a month later, to completely pull the plug, <laughs> it just, uh, I don't know, there, it's there is hard a, to understand what, what's what going on. Here's what Josh, you ready for this? I'm ready. In the age of everything, Aquarius. everything leaking. If you have some inside knowledge about why the decision was changed, maybe yeah. you're listening, you're hanging around the NIH. Uh, feel free to leak that over to us, and we will make sure that we uh, spread it around. Yeah, it almost does make you wonder if there's some politics at play where maybe some big lobbyist in the Boston area, for example, you know, who has nine R O ones. I see conspiracies everywhere all the time anymore, so I'm sure it's it's totally benign. But we'd love to have more insight. Honestly, all jokes aside, if if you do have some uh, additional knowledge about why the decision was made and then why it was changed, um, we'd love to have you on the show. Or you can just let us know, and we can uh, share with our audience what happened. Yeah, well, there's a little more to the story, um, so maybe this will put some salve on your wound a little bit. So, uh, so Francis Collins has actually come out with a new plan. Uh, has announced a new plan that he claims 23 is, points. is even more bold than the original plan. Uh, okay. <laughs> so we're scrapping this plan and coming out with a more better plan. But uh, he hasn't said what it is yet? Well, yeah, he has. So okay, here it is. Great. I'm going to tell you right now. Okay. You're killing me today. Okay. So now this is really, this has been what I've, is this the last, this I've been thinking Is this the last change up? For, for now. Okay. For now. This is, this is, we're current now. Okay. It's all about the storytelling, Dan. So now, instead of this grant score index, the current plan is NIH will set aside $210 million this year, and that money will be to fund early and mid-stage investigators' proposals who score well in peer review, but maybe their score was a little bit short of the funding cutoff. So, so specifically, this would benefit young researchers who are seeking their first grant or also those in their mid-career who are maybe trying to review, sorry, who are trying to renew an R01 for the first time. And so apparently there's some other research by NIH that there's sort of been this flattening out. There, NIH has had some initiatives that help first-time grant seekers to get those grants, but then there's been a big challenge for faculty in that really important time in their career, and when they're trying to get tenure, getting that R01 renewed. And so what now this would do is it would set money aside specifically for these early mid-career scientists. And so... Is, is $210 million the same amount that they likely would have gotten under the other plan? Well, here you go. So... So the current program is actually it's going to start with 210 million and it's going to ramp up over five years to 1.1 billion dollars targeted to this group, um, and so apparently that is enough to fund about 2,400 grants, which is far more than the grant index program would have funded according to NIH. And so NIH is saying the individual institutes will find this money by shifting money around, um, but ultimately where it's really going to come from, they say it's going to come from some of the proposals that would have funded these large labs and older investigators. Um, it has to come from somewhere, is what Francis Collins said. So true. <laughs> I don't know if I feel better or not. I, don't, I, I can't tell. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there, there's been some skepticism. I actually do want to say there's a science article um, about the NIH pulling the plug. And at the end, there was a, a quote from our grad student friend, Juan Pablo Ruiz. Remember? Friend of the show, yeah. Yeah, of course. He's at Happy Stem Cell on Twitter. Um, and so he expressed there's a lot of disappointment in the grad student and postdoc community who are very supportive of the, the uh, index change. But I don't know. I mean, People I have... who someday wanted to have a lab and now won't be able to have it, right? You know, I mean, I have a couple friends who are uh, brand new faculty and they seemed equally excited about this new plan because either way, it makes it a little easier for them to get a grant. So I don't know. I mean, NIH is trying to... I think it's very clear they see that even, not just a gut feel, not just anecdotally, but they see the data points to there's this need to fund more researchers. That, that at least philosophically, NIH believes funding more people is better than funding fewer. It's just finding a way to get from where we are, where 10% of the researchers get almost half the money. Um, how can we? Um, how can we change that? I bet you I could write a book on trickle down research 
economics and make a lot of money right now. Yeah. Sell that one. All right, Dan. That's what's new with NIH funding. That wasn't boring at all. You ruined it. All right, Dan. You know what? We had one other thing we were going to do, but this ended up being a, a longer conversation um, than I thought. So what I would love to hear, because this really is an interesting topic. This topic at least gets at a lot of interesting fundamental questions to me. Like, what should funders be funding? Like, what... Uh, do you think... What is the model for applying yeah. dollars and getting uh, yeah. innovation out of it? Yeah, like, you know, we have this quote from the MIT professor that, um, you know, we should be funding the best science, right? This meritocracy. But what does that mean, right? Are we funding the best science now? Are those 10% of labs, are they the best labs with the best ideas? Or are they not? Are they, you know, there's this, there's this quote that gets kicked around a lot in science. Maybe you heard it, Dan. And that is funding begets funding. Have you heard that before, Dan? I have not. Yeah, so the idea being it's very important to establish yourself being funded, even as a grad student or postdoc getting um, getting an early career fellowship, because oftentimes the fact you have been funded in the past makes funders in the future, it makes you seem like less of a risk. Like, okay, this person's been funded before. Yeah, I'm not the only one who thinks that they're great. Yeah, so so if that's a real phenomenon, if that's true... Well, plus you probably, if, if you are running your own lab and you get funding, that means you publish papers. And if you publish papers, that means you can get more funding. So it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd like to hear what our listeners think about how research should be funded. Um, do you think that the best research is funded under the current model? Um, and also what... What would you do about this this problem, I guess I should say, this issue of income inequality, if I can call it that, in federal funding for research? Or do you think there's a problem at all? Maybe you think the way we're doing things now is the way we should be doing things. Whatever your opinion is, um, I think it'd be really interesting to hear from our listeners and see see what they think about this issue or what they've heard about yeah, this issue. Yeah, it'd be issue. great to hear from um, people maybe in early career stages and smaller labs, but I think it'd be... E great to hear from people in some of these bigger labs that are getting five and six R01s. And what would this do to the nature of your research? And um, would your lab structure change? Would the lab split apart into uh, research faculty that could get their own grants? I mean, it'd be interesting to see all the repercussions, but I'm sure that when this came across, if you're in a bigger lab, uh, your PI noticed it and, and had some thoughts about what it would do to your particular mm -hmm. work style. And I want to go ahead and say this. Um, you know, I work a lot with students who are looking for labs to join, whether those are graduate students or post-baccalaureate students, or even talking to postdocs looking for labs. And, you know, I know there are a number of faculty out there who are excellent mentors, who are great at training scientists, and sometimes they're limited in the number of students they can take year to year uh, because of their funding situation. I think that's a common occurrence. There are probably a lot of, a lot of grad students who have entered a grad program and they've looked for faculty to do their lab rotations with, may have encountered some limitations because maybe that one faculty member you're really excited about doesn't have a grant right now, right? And that maybe that person would have been an excellent person to train you, an excellent mentor. But at the same time, there's the gigantic lab down the hall with all the postdocs who has all the funding, right? Maybe they've got room for you. Um, and maybe that would be a great training environment, uh, but maybe not. And so as we think even not just about scientific discovery, but about the role of at least academia in training the future generation of science, I think that gets lost sometimes yeah, of the importance of that function of academic research. Papers are not the only product that comes out of academic research labs, right? Students and, and researchers do. Yeah, and I can't help but think a side benefit of funding more investigators is that's more options for graduate students and for postdocs and these science trainees who are going to be the future leaders of research and more options to find that really good scientific fit and that really good mentoring fit can only benefit science overall moving forward. All right, so please let us know. And with that closed, Josh, are you ready for an etymology puzzle? Give me the words. You have the best words. The words. The clue last week was, in your nightmares, a little girl's doll bursts with these writhing, undeveloped insects. Did you have a guess? Pretty gross. Yeah, I had a nightmare about this. After I'm you. Going, yeah, it's in your nightmares. Perfect. The maggots. It is not maggots. The answer... Larvae. It's not larvae. Keep, it is good guessing. Uh, is this a Latin name? No, it is post-larval. Do you know your insect stages? Oh, um, I studied, I, I used fruit flies very briefly in the lab. But the answer was pupa. Pupa. Pupae. 
Let's yeah. do it again. Like I guessed it okay. correctly. No, you were you were like all the way around it on all sides of it. Uh, so that's the post larval stage of an insect before it becomes a uh, you know a butterfly or whatever it becomes. But 1773. Um, I think I think it was named by Carol Linnaeus, our good friend. Oh yeah, but it friend comes of the from show. friend of the show, old time. That was before podcasts. Yeah. That really was. It really was. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what he listened to in the lab. I, I'm sure uh, stringed instruments. Live string music. Yep. Yeah. So Latin pupa means girl, doll, or puppet, and it was uh, it kind of carried this meaning of an undeveloped creature. So uh, a girl, a doll, a puppet. Uh, those things don't strike me as these writhing insect things but that's fine that's where it comes from that was was a pretty uh pretty twisted into etymology clue like oh i got a handful of these maggoty things i guess maggots and pupa are different somebody's gonna call and correct us delicious okay so your clue for next week is related josh if you're ready i'm ready and uh this one will be a little bit uh, it might be easy might be tough depends on how you read it here's the clue my reflection appears small and doll-like when i gaze into your eyes I'll read it one more time. My reflection appears small and doll-like when I gaze into your eyes. Now you'll notice... I see what you did here. I obfuscated a little bit. I'm not saying which thing I'm looking for, but see if you can figure it out. Uh, The answer should fit the clue. Remember, I'm looking for a scientific word described by the clue. And once you get it, the literal meaning of that science word is a phrase in the clue itself. If you think you know the answer, email it to puzzle at hellphd.com. And I'll randomly select a winner from all the correct answers. Send the lucky puzzler an Amazon gift card. Excellent. Thank you for that puzzle, Dan. And thanks for the discussion today. This was uh, this was interesting. All right. Well, we'll have to continue the topic next week. And uh, we'd love to hear from the listeners. All right, Dan. It's been a joy to drink some brown ale with you. Josh, we'll see you in a few weeks. See you in a few weeks with an IPA.